It is a pleasure for me to introduce Violeta Garmin Rosas. Uh, she's from uh, Mexico City, City, also she grew in Jalapa. Uh, she did her uh, degree on mathematics within a joint program of the University of Guanajuato and CIMAT. Among the optional courses, she took one in astronomy, and that is how she decided to do her bachelor thesis on uh, math application for astronomy. And then she did her master thesis in uh, astronomy in Guanajuato and moved to the Netherlands to go for, to do her PhD in astronomy at the University of Leiden, uh, where she is currently a postdoc. Out of curiosity, before all of that, she studied violin in the Conservatorio de la Universidad Veracruzana. Um, she had uh, led several works on the uh, very famous local legend in 1668, and I think she, she will be talking about <laughs> that today. <laughs> Okay. Thank you, thank you, Mara, and uh, well, thank you for the invitation. And yes, this is um, practically all the work that I have been doing during my PhD. So I'm actually practicing for my PhD colloquium in Leiden that I have to give soon. <laughs> but okay, um, so uh, my PhD uh, focused in uh, three main areas. One was the uh, um, dusty of the 1668. One was the composition of the dust of that torus, and the third part was about the molecular torus of NG668. So I will spend most of my time on the first part, the dust torus, because that project took like three parts of my PhD, so it's, and it, there are a lot of details to, to tell, and I think it's the most interesting part. And actually my lab work has not been published, so I'm, I don't know how much I, 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 I am supposed to to, to be allowed to talk about it, but I want to share a few slides about it. So, so just to introduce uh, AGM, uh, and AGM is a galaxy that contains a massive accreting black hole. And one uh, interesting way to define it is through the Edinger ratio, which is uh, it has to exceed 10 to the minus 5. And AGM is emitted all over the electromagnetic spectrum, as we can see here. Uh, with their radio loud, we see them showing their radio uh, frequencies. Uh, this red uh, dashed line, this is the torus. Then we have some uh, optical and UV emission of the accretion disk. And we also have X rays in the photocorona uh, and other parts uh, close to the, very close to the accretion disk. And sometimes we can even find gamma rays. And lately, it seems to be that also neutrinos. So it's, it's a very interesting object. And I think this is really cool that we can actually use every wavelength to study them. Mm -hmm. And every wavelength with doubles differences. The most difficult parts to study actually is where they mix, because then we have to separate them. But OK. Uh, why are AGS important? Well, um, according to this um, k luminosity function of galaxies, if we see here the models, um, the lambda CDM cosmology in, uh, evolution, galaxy evolution, give us this, um, this relation. But the observations actually give us this other relation. And so it has been mm, supposed, and we, we, we now uh, expect to explain this by, at least in this side, by AGN feedback, and in this side, by supernova feedback. So what does it mean? It means that. Uh, somehow the AGN is doing something to the medium in the galaxy and it's either suppressing the star formation or triggering it. So we can actually talk about positive or negative feedback. So, um, mm, before we used to classify them in two main types, at least the uh, not, not uh, radio, loud, radio quiet, uh, the type one and the type two, and it was mainly based on the kind of emission lines that we were finding, either broad or narrow, and also about uh, the, the, the growth or the uh, velocities that we were finding. And uh, well, the type one practically includes cipher ones and quasars, and type two, uh, we call them cipher twos, and well, they include these near infrared optical UV emission lines. And so in 1993, uh, and 1995, 
Antonucci, Uri, and Padovani came up with this idea of uh, trying to explain these two types of galaxies with one unique model, where we needed uh, those two doors here, and it depended on where, how were we looking at uh, the AGN, particularly is the inclination angle that we that we were looking through. Uh, then we will see either type ones because we will be looking at the very center of the AGN or type two stage because the torus uh, the dust will be blocking uh, the photons coming from the accretion disk and Brolin region, and then we will see only actually only the narrow lines. So in this case, we see narrow lines and broad lines. In this case, we only see the narrow lines because the broad lines are um, are blocked by the doors, by the dust doors. And so there was a lot of early evidence. Uh, practically, it's alignments and misalignments. So of what? Well, the polarization position angles with the radio structures in the case of type one objects. The, uh, in this case, this is an anti-alignment between the optical polarization position angle uh, with the radio structure in the type two. And a general alignment of the ionization cost with the radio structure. But there was also an infrared excess and there are many AGS we have observed already very deep silicate features. So this is also how the, the idea of having a lot of dust there came up. So um, what happened? Well, um, this was called the torus because of the toroidal shape that we were expecting around the efficient beach, around the black hole. And this was a very, very naive, very simple model how we started uh, modeling it. So there's no torus. Uh, but the, the main, uh, idea here is that these dusty torus had to obscure mm -hmm. the central engine, it had to collimate the narrow line region, and possibly it had to fit the black hole. So for these two to be complied, we need <coughs> electrically and optically thick torus. So that's extremely important. Now, this as we kept on observing AGS with very low resolution. Uh, we started finding out that the spectral energy distribution were not matching really what we were obtaining with these models. So the models started evolving. And the next uh, important uh, idea was the clumpy torus. So we will have uh, also this, actually this helped to keep the thickness of the torus because uh, otherwise it will flatten out very, very fast and then you have no geometrically thick structure. So this was helping by the inelastic collisions of the blocks, uh, was helping to keep this high, uh, this uh, ratio of the height and the, and the, yeah. So, okay. But again, the, the observations were not uh, completely coinciding, actually not, not even now, we're still working on it. But then uh, we noticed that a two-phase medium was actually giving a much better. So this is break the hybrid of these two. You have clumps, but you also have a smooth dust spread around. And so as we as I go on, I'll tell you more about these models. But right now let me introduce NG density eight. It's a cipher two. It's it's called a hidden cipher one because in polarized light um you can see the online region and this is this uh this was observed at Anthony and Miller in 1985. And actually this was the practically one of the most important objects uh where they got inspired from this theory of unification. And it's a bar spiral, it's one of the closest AGNs, it's at only 14.4 megaparsecs, and uh, it has a Black hole mass of 1.5 times 10 to the 7 solar masses. It's considered a radio quiet uh, AGN, uh, but it does have a radio, a radio jet. And this radio jet is very messy. So I, I forgot to add this slide, but I think it only goes from here to here. So this is zooming in. And if we zoom in uh, even more, we find this structure, and the black hole is bottom here. So we think that the jet is being launched north-south, and it's actually being deflected here at cloud C, here. 
um, propylene. So, how do we study NGC 1068? Well, for the torus, so what was the complication? Why, why we have to start with models? Because the observations were not resolved in the torus. Um, so, to resolve it, but also because, I mean, you need to observe in the right wavelengths. The emission of the dust peaks in the infrared wavelengths. So, you need uh, very special detectors for this that were developed only, only recently. So, what happens to obtain to achieve the resolution that we need? We actually need to use interferometry. So just like ALMA or like the VLA, which you have many antennas separated from phantomers, uh, here in this case we have uh, four telescopes. Uh, we also have four small telescopes. These are like uh, I think two meter, one point eight meter diameter. These are eight meter diameter telescopes. These are in Cerro Paraná in Chile in the VLT. And so what we do is that we observe and we um, send the beams to this uh, room where we have the instruments and we do the interferometry there. Now, interferometry in the optical wavelengths is much, much, much more difficult than in the radio because you don't have um, these things that amplify the signal. You don't have, you cannot save the signal and then do the interferometry. You have to do it on time, alive, right there at the moment. And the problem with the infrared is very difficult to do this because the atmosphere is really, really, uh, well, to start with, everything here emits an infrared. We emit an infrared. The atmosphere emits an infrared. So you have to get rid of all that. The telescopes are emitting an infrared. So you have to get rid of all that background. And also because the atmosphere is actually disturbing your face. So you need to also compensate for that disturbance. So it's also difficult to deal with that. So, okay, so my thesis here, um, and uh, it can observe in the L, M, and N bands from 2.7 to 13 microns. We can do spectroscopy with different resolutions, uh, actually very low, 30, medium, 100 to 300, and high, 500 to 1,000. Uh, it's, it's very difficult. Yeah. People that work with stars, I, I bet they're they're laughing about the theory, <laughs> but it's very difficult to do to do this kind of work. So in the infrared, so we combine the light of four telescopes and we do image reconstruction with high angular resolution. We can achieve up to three to the sixteen milliards seconds on the wavelength. So to, in at three microns, we can achieve three milliards seconds resolution, which is super 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 cool. <laughs> so uh, these were our long list of collaborators <laughs> from, uh, they all have to do design, Matisse, to build it, uh, to finance it, uh, to take it to Rana, to commission it, et cetera, et cetera, to build the pipeline, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I was part of this only from when it started commissioning. So, but all these people is really, really expert in interferometry and they built the predecessor of Matisse, which was MIDI, also was at Rana but it will only combine the light of two telescopes at a time. So we will not uh, do image reconstruction. We will only make partial modeling or simple modeling. So now a bit more about 1068. Uh, there were measures actually at, at the position of the black hole. And these were measures actually uh, span velocities from minus 300 plus 300 kilometers a second. This means uh, that if, obviously if we, if we assume a Keplerian rotating disk, the black hole mass is 10 to the 7 solar masses, and the structure is like 0.8 parsecs long. Uh, it's oriented nearly perpendicular to the jet axis. Uh, here, here it's, it's uh, a little bit of, if you want to take it like this as the inner jet, or like this as the outer jet. So it's, it, I think they took rather the outer jet, not, not the inner jet. But okay, uh, it's uh, I don't know, sorry, sorry. This is this square refers to the radio continuum in the five gigahertz. Yeah. So uh, because it's well aligned with the um, water emission disk, and it was explained as thermal free free emission from an edge ray in the corona or from winds from the molecular disk. Now this is important because this means that we need very very high temperatures here, and we will get out of this. So. What happened when medium observed 1068? Well, this is one of the very first works 
they found actually two components, a central very hot component, where they thought, okay, maybe the black holes here, because the temperatures of those are very high, and a larger component with lower temperatures, 220 Kelvin. And as you can see, we're here resolving one parsec scales. But as I said, MIDI could only do uh, functional modeling. Uh, but this, this work that Lopez Gonzaga does on for is actually amazing because um, they used other more, more complicated techniques to finally, I don't know what's the name, but okay, to finally make a three version model, and this is what they obtain. So they resolved uh, these two central structures that we saw before, but the angle is changing, right? It's that when you add UV points, you get more information about the geometry and position angles, and et cetera, et cetera, sizes, et cetera, et cetera. And so you can actually um, tune the right angle. So here was thought to be the black hole because of the disk shape and because of the high temperature of the dust. Uh, but these two, this, this uh, series, uh, terminal recovery was not really explained in the paper. And this one was explained as the inner wall of a dusty cone. So now we have here a scale bar of 10 parsecs. And the interesting part is that when Mili observed more AGNs, this was something completely unexpected. I mean, we were expecting this donut around the black hole close, but we were not expecting having dust out there, right? So this was actually an, an amazing work by, uh, again, Lopez Gonzaga, 2016, where they found that seven out of 10 P3 AGNs, sorry, Mili, showed the extended emission, but the extended emission is actually oriented along the polar axis. So this was interpreted as of the most big dusty winds that are being launched from the accretion disk, perpendicular to the accretion disk. Uh, now, I have to remark, this is seven out of 23, because nowadays, I think, is is everyone is very tired about this model of the disk plus wind, but I think that it's it's not, it's not, <laughs> it's important, it's, it's something, it's a new idea, it's, but it's not everywhere, right? So, okay, so, Yes, of course, now the Taurus models have to evolve. Why? Because there is this new idea of the dusty bits. So not only that, you have to start taking down the kinematics because what is launching that wind? How far? How fast? We don't care because we have kinematics. But how far is it going? How, how much dust is it being thrown, et cetera, et cetera. So OK, new models came up. This is the radiation the rain fountain that whether it adds to the dust. And so. They keep on evolving. Uh, so now, what happened in 2018? Well, there is another instrument called gravity in the VLDI, it's next to Matisse, actually. But this one observes the k band The k band is around two microsoids for dust. Uh, but this is relative. This is just talking in very general terms. And I will tell you why. So they made this. Um, Beautiful image reconstruction. They have like, I don't know, like 38 UV points, no more. There was a crazy amount of UV points. So they made this uh, image reconstruction and they they um, make, make many models where they would calculate the uh, temperature of the dust. And they concluded that this would be 1,500 Kelvin. And so they said, well, then the black one must be here and this looks very nice, like a disk. And so this must be. Uh, just like a ring-like structure, uh, not not thick as expected. So the conclusion practically is we don't we don't see the torus. We only see the sublimation radius. So this happened in two thousand eighteen, and this is how they. Uh, so I yeah, yeah, uh, have to 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 remark here that. Neither Matisse nor neither, neither gravity have uh, stometry, so we cannot really plan things perfectly, which is why we take smart guesses and, and mostly based on morphologies. So, this is how they align the main source, the VWA source, the radio source, uh, and their sources in the K band. And so, okay. So, now coming back to Matisse, uh, by 2019, we have many observations. We had a good pipeline, it was running 
this is our data looks like here we can see the square visibilities and the closure phases. We can also obtain other observables, but they are more difficult to calibrate and to work with. So we started working with these with these two. And this is already telling us two things. One is that if the visibilities, square visibilities are less than one, it means that we are resolving the source. So this is really good because this is what we want. We want to, to see the structure and the size of the turbs. And here, having closure phases so different to zero, this means that we are expecting to find a lot of asymmetry because any symmetric object will give closure phases of uh, zero. So we started modeling these regressions when we had, uh, I think, like two, two, two data sets from the commissioning. And this is what we found, which is really good because it's consistent with the MIDI uh, regression model that I showed you, but it's missing the extended uh, version. So this is a 3.4 microns. And we actually found that also at 4 and 4.7 microns, we, we recovered the two sources. So this is L, L and M bands. And so we were very excited about this. This are UV coverage. We, we decided that this um, commissioning snapshot was really bad, so we didn't use it at the end. And by November 7, 2017, we got three more snapshots uh, of our GTO time. Uh, but they actually don't count because we lost, they count as, as two and a half because we lost one telescope in one of them. And so, unfortunately, <laughs> NGC 1068 is almost at, at, uh, at the horizon. So, so, so Delta Zero, so the UV drives are actually very horizontal. We don't get a full, nice, roundish or elliptically recurrent. So, it's very difficult also to work with it. But, so when we added this, not, the, not only commissioning data, but also the GTO data, we actually were able to make image reconstruction. And this was really amazing for us because we didn't have so many UV points. We had very few, but the, the source is so asymmetric that with only those UV points, we were getting already uh, interesting results. And here, uh, these are not to scale. I just want to show you uh, the similarities. We found two sources in the L and M band. And we were able to prove that the second one is real. And in the end, band, we find a lot of extended emission, which is also super cool because MIDI, MIDI is n band. And we saw that it had this longer ellipse. Now, the detail is that the MIDI Locus Consortium of Routine Work Literature was made with UT and AT data, and this is only made with UT data. So, what's the difference? The difference is that the AT data uh, has smaller, uh, shorter baselines, so you observe more the extended mission. And with the UTs, you, you cannot see it. So the field of view is different. That's the difference. So, okay, so here, how did we prove that the second service is real? Well, we made narrow one image reconstructions, and we always, we took the median, and we always recovered the second source. So we were really happy about this. Now, how did we, um, identified uh, our images with the k band images. Well, again, because we don't have astrometry, this we have to do it by eye. And this is how we thought is the best way it can fit. So we were happy. Um, now, because gravity had published before us, we had to be extremely careful because if we were we were going to to get a distinct, distinct result, we had to prove it to, to leave it very clear that, that it was correct. So we had to do a lot of double checks, and this was one of them. We did uh, imaging with four different techniques. Uh, this is software Myra, software Iris, with sponsors models, and with Gaussian models. And, and even though the structures sometimes look similar, sometimes they don't look so similar. So this is in the L-band, all these are L-band. Uh, you see a second source always, and this is N-band, and you see at least this extended stuff here, and so, below here always, but the structures done are not very similar. But then what we have to do is that at the end, what we hear is that the flux that we were getting were consistent in all these uh, image reconstructions or, or imaging techniques. So how did we make sure about this? Well, we took the image reconstruction. Um, we we tried, actually, we tried to, to do multi-gaussian models before 
we found out that we had the instructions. The problem was that um, it was not possible. <laughs> it was never converging. The image reconstructions were extremely important to know where to put the, the Gaussians. So, okay, now that we had things that were converging, we could uh, take define areas of interest, like these ellipses, and take uh, for all the wavelengths where we were doing image reconstructions, take the fluxes. So it's kind of like an aperture photometry technique. And so we could finally make some SEDs and mm -hmm. um, SDFs where we could learn about those properties. So those temperatures, those composition, and of the gas depth. <laughs> so one of the very surprising first results was that we, we didn't need um, regular ISM dust, we needed amorphous olivines, um, not too big, of 0.1 microns, and we also needed some carbon base. And this is related to my second work, I will get there soon. And so, okay, but what happened with the K-band? So we talked to the hierarchy team and we said, okay, what, what can, how much flux do you have inside this area? They give us a number and it's here. And so uh, inside this area. So it's not so bad. It's not perfect, but it's not so bad. And here I show you what happens when you use the standard ISM dust. The fit is completely, completely off, just completely off. So okay. So uh, another double check that we did was the photometry, and we needed to to see that our photometry was matching single dish photometry made previously. So this was also very important. So uh, as we selected all these areas of interest, we found out that most of them needed two black bodies. And this is super nice because this is consistent with the clumpy models because uh, if you gen uh, average the temperatures, you find that with two temperatures, you can uh, describe very well. Now, I told you we don't have astrometry. So how did we, how are we sure that the alignment that we did in image reconstructions is okay? Well, we found out that if we shifted them by three megaseconds, which is our resolution, actually the, the SEDs could not be fitted. They were completely unphysical. So we were super happy about this. And here I am showing you uh, for the solar extension, uh, we got uh, high temperatures and they differ depending on how much carbon we put. Here's with no carbon and if we put 20% of carbon in mass, then the temperatures can, can increase a lot. So this is very important. So, okay, so now we have all these regions and we can make actually thermal. And what's what we find? We find that the in the extended, uh, we call it diffuse emission, extended areas, the temperatures are very low of about 230 Kelvin. But as we zoom into the northern complex, we find very high temperatures from 550 to 1,400. But in E1, which is the source where we, where we put the gravity sources, we actually have a low temperature where, where they want to put the black hole. And if this was a sublimation region, you need at least 1,000 Kelvin temperature. So this was, this was uh, yeah, this was cool. <laughs> and the other, part, the other thing, interesting thing is that in the solar extension, we also find very high, very high temperatures. So, okay, uh, we also, uh, looked at the extinction, we found that there are large variations at very small scales, and that the opacities were increasing systematically from the center to the southwest. So this was telling us that there is a layer of dust that has a de density gradient towards the southwest. So and this matches nicely the the the, the disk that we are this that the pressure disk uh, the maser disk the water maser disk. So okay, now. The last step that we did, because we, we okay, we have a, a, a thermal map, we know about the dust, but what else? What else? So we decided to look at the ALMA 256 hertz with similar resolution of invalid theory at R2019, and we found morphological similarities. I don't know if this, this is free free emission from hot electron gas, but the emission that we see when Matisse is actually cool dust, 300, 230 Kelvin. So this was also uh, very interesting. Now, in the case of the L-band uh, image reconstruction, where we uh, looked at this new VLBA 22 gigahertz continuum, uh, we 
they begin to find some kind of morphological similarity and same same surprise. How can it be that we have that the dogs can survive in such a hot environment? So putting everything together, we concluded that the black hole must be here. So not not here where where we uh, cross match the gravity sources and not over our hot, hottest dust. No, but rather kind of like in the middle, like in this voice. So we think here is so absorbed, there is so much dust, it's so absorbed that we don't see it in L and in bats. We only see it in M. We only see the outer color dust because everything else is absorbed. So um this this um <laughs> this 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 took a lot of time, a lot of work, and, and we were very happy because it was worthy. We were able to push this in nature. Um, so we were super happy about it. And so these are the conclusions of this part of my talk. The observations with Matisse help us to understand the properties of the dust with super high angular resolution. And we have spectroscopy information in L, M, and N bands. And this this uh tell us that if we if we uh, use more wavelengths, it, you can get more precise information. Uh, and the torus, so so we, we think this is a torus, right? If we put black hole here, we are seeing the hot dust and we're seeing the cold dust. It's not that I'm not that it's just like it's just like more like an onion. You will see the layers depending on the temperature and on the optical depth and the density of the dust. Yeah. Um, but it it agrees with the idea of the classical torus because it's obscure. The vision disk, uh, but also with the modern idea of the dust units because we have this extended emission. And well, this, this because uh, the dust is not the dust used in the models, this actually paves the way for new approach towards models. So, okay, now, what, when we observe 1068 with an eight meter telescope, this is what we see in the L band. So here's 3.4 microns. And this is very similar to the um, aliphatic hydrocarbon feature that we see in diffuse ISM in our galaxy. So what happened in our data, we noticed that some square visibilities had a bond around that element. <coughs> so we decided to work on it. So this was my second project. What can we learn about this? So from the square visibilities, we subtracted more fluxes. Then we did continuum subtracted anomalous features. We assumed that the continuum was a straight line. And here is the comparison at different, um, with different apertures of how the feature. So it's, it's the same galaxy, uh, but just with different resolutions and with different apertures. And okay, in general, the peaks agree. That's the important part that the width agrees and that the peaks in general agree. So we started working with, with the correlative fluxes is what you obtained from when you only observe um, the data that you obtained from two telescopes at a time. So uh, it tells you about what's happening at that position angle and at, with that uh, resolution that you obtained with that baseline length. So uh, we noticed that we have to select the baselines because the signal to noise ratio falls really badly at the short equations. So we recovered 18 basins, and we noticed that the depths of the feature were varying, but we had always the same shape. So uh, this means that the, the all of them, because we, we obviously we had to downgrade the resolution of the aliphatic ground feature, but they all agree more or less okay with that shape. So we think that all these are caused by the alpha hydrocarbons. Mm -hmm. And this is the, the how the optical depth is varying. And we can see that they vary over scales of 0.2 to 1.4 parsecs. Well, it's hard to convert from meters, but okay. But this is in the plane of the sky. So the variations might be at larger distances, actually. But okay. So when we looked at only the shortest baselines, so these ones that have an arrow here, and when we see what, how does it change with the position angle, we actually see that the, um, 
smaller position angles have a larger optical depth. And this is very interesting because this will mean that the um, that it is increasing towards the inner radio jet and close to the center of the ionization point. The problem here is that we didn't have enough UV points to really see where it was it picking. So it's, it only gives us an idea on the distribution, but this is really interesting. Uh, we also studied the mass ratio of the carbonaceous to silicate or the pine dust. So in this case, we compared to our results in the end bank. And we noticed that the uh, it, it's in accordance to several lines of sight of the diffuse ice and in our galaxy. So this is also really cool. Uh, and now, finally, we're working with ANA. With the dust, we don't we don't have kinematics. With ANA, we can have kinematics. And previously, it was found that uh, the circumnuclear disk, so this is 70 parsecs, uh, shows recent star forming activity. But as we zoom into the molecular torus, we, we find strong non circular motions, enhanced turbulence, and the, there seems to be an upper, apparent counter rotation. Um, so, in Penitary et al. 2019, studied this further, and they found the same that the outer disk is actually counter rotating relative to the inner disk. So, this is the inner disk, and this, this, this one is rotating with the galaxy, but outside seems to be counter rotating. So we are looking further to this. This is a very nice image of the AMA band 7 continuum, CO322 in red contours, and HCO plus 423 in green contours. We actually resolve absorption, which is also pretty amazing with AMA with so much resolution. And first thing that we did was, okay, we have very, very large language. Can we make them with just uh, beam, uh, beam spreading, beam smearing. Can you, can you do that with beam smearing? And the answer is yes. So this is data. You can see the, the yellow. We can obtain the same yellow close to the same areas, but not in these cases. We made two models, two different models. But what we did is in this one, we concentrated uh, everything towards the center. So, OK, it's just. One small result, but we're not sure if this works happening. So the next step is just to make models. So we started working with 3D Barolo. Um, and um, so this is how, how the models look like in HEO blows, in CO. And the funny, the funny thing is that we could not find a good fit that would be happy with both sides of the disk. We have to either fit one side or the other side. And in one side, we don't need counter rotation, but in the other side, we do need counter rotation. There is no other way to have a good fit. So this is very interesting. It's, uh, as I said before, it's not published yet, but uh, we think that maybe there is an accretion event that is very, very recent. And this is why it has not set up. It has not gone around. It's just calling render and it's causing a big mess. And it's very interesting because this is the easiest way to fit a black hole. If you throw something that, that is against the movement, then you can you can very easily get rid of the angular momentum. So it's very interesting. So uh, that's this my last slide. Uh, there are many open questions. I'm super interested in what is the cycle of the dust. Uh, also, where's the chemistry of the hot dust? Because we know the temperatures, but we don't know how is it, what is it formed of? We don't know that. What's happening with the plant rotation uh, and the morphological similarity between the alma continuum and the end band emission? How can we have these very hot gas coexisting with the cold dust? Uh, the astrometry is, a, is an open, open question, but there is a, a model right now that seems to confirm our. our not the temperatures, but the way we we um, cross identify the gravity and the natural sources. And finally, why is there so much symmetry? I think that's that's also also very interesting, and I think it might be related with the counter rotation, but it's it's hard to it's hard to get there. <laughs> but I think that's ah, yeah, I guess this is my 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 really last slide. Um. In Lyon, we have what is called the LIPS program. 
is for a summer program for pre PhD students of any nationality. You get paid, it's for eight weeks, you get paid the trip, everything, housing, meals, everything. And you work with one researcher, I think it's most postdocs, for all this time. And uh, it's really, really cool. You learn a lot and you have, you learn, you meet the professors over there and you learn how is the, also the ambiente, which is really cool. And applications are open in January 24, 2024. So <laughs> that's it. I, I don't think you have a last slide after that. Give you a little question. Yeah. Where you are. Yeah. No, see, uh, uh, with respect, oh, oh, sorry. With respect to the, to your uh, previous slide, fourth point. Yes. Uh, you, uh, you said uh, so. How can warm dust coexist with hot gas? Mm -hmm. Hot gas. Okay. Why coal? The dust. Yes. It's at three hundred twenty seven or less. Two hundred thirty seven maximum three hundred seven. And what if it would be hot dust? Mm, we calculate. I mean, it's this is based the um, this is based on the thermal map that we make with the L M and N max. Yes, yes, no. But my, my question is really so. You you would be not surprised if there was hot dust coexisting with hot gas. Mm -hmm. Okay, but can no, actually no, because it's millions of Kelvin gas, so it would be ah, okay. ah okay. So it, it's, yes. it's not the question why cold dust is just white dust. Why is it there? Yeah, yeah, yeah okay. exactly. Uh, Exactly. Okay. And uh, I have another question also about the um, uh, possible contamination for you observing along a line of sight, for example, the K band to be contaminated by stellar emission. Um, You're observing a bunch, be, basically. It can be. Yeah, yeah. I don't remember if they were careful with that in the paper. I don't remember that detail in the K band. I have two questions. The first one is related to one of the images where you show the temperatures of the images. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, I saw that the, in the center, the temperature was uh, lower than in the diffuse uh, emission. Why, why does that happen? I expect it to be higher so this is this is the center the minimum temperature is about 550 and the diffuse emission is this which is lower 230 150 but, 230 but if we compare the the e1 with e5 for example in the mm -hmm. this and this yes mm -hmm. this one we don't we didn't consider as diffuse okay is the is the same structure all all the emissions the five emissions is the same structure? Yeah, exactly. That's why we call it the northern complex. And the other question is related with the chemical composition you found. <clears throat> uh, you found that olivine is uh, a good fit to the photometric points. <laughs> uh, what uh, optical properties do you use? For olivines? Uh, what do you mean with optical properties? We just had like uh, the. Um, the astronomical silicates or something like that? Or which no, no, just, just all lines. So only, only these. So we have the absorption spectrum of this. I think the Ulysses question was where, where, ex where exactly did you get that from? Because he's using some yes, yes. Yeah. Uh, like you, like absorption in the extinction coefficient. Yeah, yeah, it's okay. It's in the paper. You can find it in the paper. I don't remember. Mean, mean, mean. I don't remember the year. Close on it's being something like that. Okay, thank you. I had another question, Sinjar. Yes. <laughs> About uh, this, is, these are the, the composition that you tried, or you tried more, and these are the one that better. he tried a lot. <laughs> and uh, uh, yes. I was wondering whether, uh, whether you tried uh, more composition than this, and how, which sizes of the grades? We, we tried from 0.01 to 5 microns, okay. actually. 
Uh, and the, and the other to the extremes, not the other one, really, really was 0.1.3 maximum microns per gene. Um, and in compositions, we tried all kinds of things, even, even um, crystal, crystalline dust. Yeah, nothing more. <laughs> Other questions? So, is it that you only use single size grain models? Yeah, here, yes. Uh, you didn't try any example of a distribution of grains? We tried a parallel of the ice, ice or a parallel of different things, and that didn't work. It, uh, it always worked with two temperatures, only two temperatures. That, that was the thing. And uh, fi uh, fixing the dust. With this composition, with this chemical composition, and this size. So, uh, in this case, because it's a multi-parameter space, did you explore it just by keeping everything else fixed and varying one thing, or did you do a more MCMC uh, -MC kind of approach? Mm, what do you mean with keeping what fixed? So, uh, for example, when you explored the grain size distribution parameter, did you keep the chemistry fit, the metrology fixed? Or did you also, so did you consider, if you have four parameters, did you consider a grid of this entire four parameters? Yeah. We only, uh, we only changed the composition and the size, which we only played with those two. But simultaneously or one yeah. by one? That's the question. If yes. you, I think the question is, if you were varying both the size and the, comp and the composition at the same time, or if you would, Fix the composition, vary the size, or yeah. fix the size, vary the composition. Exactly. Fix the composition, vary the okay. size, okay. fix the size, vary the composition. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Second round. <laughs> so, in, in all of, for example, in all of this picture of, of the dust emission, where would the polar, the, the broad, Language of polarized light come from. Do you have any idea of that? So where exactly is because probably it's polarized by dust. Mm -hmm. uh, so where dust where then? Mm, it's just part of the, wait, 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 sorry. So where would be the black hole in, in this picture? Uh, around here. Yes. The point is that you still have in her view, you still have a curve. Yes, which is the black thing. It, yeah, part part, part, is part of it is larger. It's it's all this actually. I mean just you, you, the black thing is is that you don't see the L band emission because it's so absorbed. Okay. Is there a black but it is inside? Is there a black thing or is the black thing an absence of the red thing? It's an absence <laughs> of emission. Exactly. Okay. It's an absence of uh, hot dust emission. You are seeing the back part of the ghost, not the. I'm, I'm not seeing the. The, the bright, the bright part is the back part of the ghost. Uh, in my oh, mind. Okay. Yeah. the see The inner part, which is the spotter, yeah. is what you can see. For you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. So, so there's the red. In the cold dust, and you see it, uh, you see it, you see it in the front, you see it all. Oh. But the the stuff here, you only see red, you don't see blue or, or green because it's so absorbed. Okay. <laughs> and what's the optical depth in the uh, what, in whatever band? <laughs> uh, <laughs> I don't remember. I but it must be very very high. Yes. Like like in N band must be like ten or twenty or so. Mm, no. Well, the thing is that um, we have to because we could not convert this to optical uh, uh, column densities yes. because we would have to take too many assumptions. So we left everything in terms of the kind of dust that we have and the yeah, just just the optical depth that we saw in the only in the silicate feature. And we have table in paper, I don't have it here. So. Okay. Uh, related to, is there any single tracer or any, any wavelength that picks at the proposed position of the black hole? 
I know the astrometry you can read, you know, and this infrared interference is, is difficult to make the absolute astrometry picture, but but the, the measures any single tracer that picks. Well, the measures are good. Are good. Right. You yes. don't have too much space. You have to put it either a little bit up or a little bit down, depending on the model that you are using, or you have to to explain how are they being being produced physically, and so if they are coming from back to this or coming from the this, so <laughs> but you can only you have like a plus plus minus one year second no. tolerance here, but they, it has to be very close to the green to the green uh, measures. And in here, actually, we assume that the peak of the of the this emission of the radio emission had to be associated with the agent. So the peak of the free free is is associated with the agent. That's what we assumed. Another thing would be a millimeter DFDI observations, and then you you constrain a bit more the the base of the millimeter. Ah, uh, VLBI. That's that's VLBI. Yes. yes, yes, I know, but millimeter VLBI. So much uh, higher uh, frequency so you you can constrain mm -hmm. a bit better the position because with the, AMA we have, we have a huge problem actually mm -hmm. that the we don't know why the faces are off and the position doesn't coincide with the Gallimore's position it's uh, like if I mm, plot it it will fall here so it's strange I mean because we, we will assume that the peak of the continuum in the millimetric wavelengths is where we have the AGM. And it, it, I mean, it makes sense also because of the uh, shape that we have here of the CO and the HCO plus, which are uh, dense gas tracers. Yeah, but I'm not talking about uh, the ALMA, ALMA, mm -hmm. ALMA telescope, ALMA ray. I'm talking about VLB, millimeter, global millimeter VLBI. So uh, uh, adding telescope from Europe, US, mm -hmm. and also Ireland, maybe. Mm -hmm. So you have a, a, I think there's a project much now. higher angular I think, I think there's a project now to observe it. Yeah. Yeah. I think you are in the Maybe you are the I think so, yes. <laughs> but see, so the, that's the oh. VA, yeah, 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 uh, listen to me, but yeah, uh, that position is is really is really good. The VLBA actually to be. There is another question. Yeah, I'm not an HN specialist, uh, but I'm thinking in terms of general physics. And you said one of the open question is how uh, hot gas and and uh, dust uh, in maybe in small or small compact can coexist. I, I think it's it's very interesting that it's exactly in that area that you find olivine because if you ask uh, a geologist, he says that's associated with volcanism, with the hottest phenomena. And, and everywhere you look, olivine is what you get when you bake stuff very well. And I mean, that proves that you are having dust in, in a hot environment. Uh, I think it's a very convincing case uh, that there you find olivine. I was just wondering, I know you don't have um, velocities or anything, but what are the expected velocities for this this wind? For the wind? I don't know. I don't know. Ah, but there, oof, there are they're having many AMA results uh, of, of winds, molecular winds. And they reach for 100 kilometers a second. We find an inflow uh, with like 1,300 kilometers a second in, in our last work, but we are not completely sure that it's real. <laughs> we could interpret it as an inflow or we could, I don't know, <laughs> interpret as something else. <laughs> but yeah, it's just that the, the um, there are some models, but they just take. Like, too many assumptions that are not directly observed anywhere. So I don't know if there is questions from the from the Zoom people. We don't. I'll ask. Uh, I pregunta in Zoom. There is one one person. Uh, that, that was me. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> okay, no, we, we don't have any questions. Okay. <laughs> Just as a last question, are there any plans to observe other objects? I know in this agency is the most famous uh, agent, but I will be happy with Matisse. With Matisse, there, there are two papers out of uh, Cirsin, the Cirsin is the other one. Yes, <laughs> uh, yes. <laughs> the M band was first, was, it was easier, and the L and M band now it is out. Uh, and it's very interesting because it was fitted very nicely with the Salevsky models, mm -hmm. but they needed a, an extra bit of hot dust in order to make a little bit oh like this mm -hmm. in the SED. No, no, That's they don't sticky. know. They don't know. <laughs> Just like a, a little bit more of hot dust than the, than the model was um, assuming. So that was very interesting. And we're working on some Sen A, which was Sen oh. observations. But we have kind of like 10, 10 other agents observed. Oh, okay. it's just the data is extremely difficult. So many more time to read. Yeah, it's really good because they are painted. Yes. Yes, yes, exactly. Yeah. So we have been happy to see what happens with our other less complex. Uh, less yes, papers. yes, I'm, I'm very interested in the dust because so far it's like. Hmm. On one where, like, like you mentioned in your talk the other day, like, it's a strange, it's a strange guy. Extrapolate what happens to any system basically to add to the whole population of aging in space. It's hard. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if uh, there is no more questions, let's ask again the viewer.